The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're really honored to be the present caretakers during this era of the magazine. This is Texas and it's big and wonderful and so diverse we will never run out of stories. A couple of things they need to think about all the time. They need to think about light first and foremost, whether it's natural light with the sun or artificial light if you're introducing some strobes. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. It doesn't really matter how many people you have when you have really dedicated, really talented people. Is it one of these or a Each one? month, these people share stories. <laughs> Our challenge always is trying to tell the story of conservation in interesting ways. How are we going to tell this story in a way that resonates? If you want to change it. This small staff of writers, photographers, designers, and editors collects content from a very large state and presents it in a magazine. Everything is a collaboration. We each bring our own little taste to the table. You have something better. <laughs> Everyone needs to come in and offer suggestions. That's nicer than saying, are you? Just looked weird to me. That kind of creative tension helps us create a better magazine. Yeah, we're running out of time. The most important thing about magazine planning is the term long range. A year and a half in advance is completely mapped out. There are pressures. Time constraints. Uh, you know, there's a deadline deadlines. We try to push them sometimes. But each month, these folks produce the premier outdoor magazine of Texas, continuing a tradition that spans 75 years. The magazine started in December of 1942. seemed kind of an odd time to think about producing a new magazine, especially one devoted to hunting and fishing and conservation. The country has asked the people to invest a billion dollars in one month to help pay for the war. What were they thinking in the middle of a world war to start a magazine? <laughs> then it was called Texas Game and Fish. I've poured over every issue. The agency the magazine was under at that time was the Texas Game, Fish, and Oyster Commission. The State Parks Board was a separate entity back then. They had been doing a monthly newsletter that they distributed free of charge. And I guess at this point they needed to decide, is, is that something we should continue to do? There were shortages of paper, um, men were going off to war, so there was a shortage of labor, there was a shortage of writers and photographers, and everything that's needed to put out a magazine was in short supply. So they made the decision to create a bigger publication, charge a, a subscription fee, and that produced the money for printing. So that was the practical reason for doing it. But their view was that in all of the chaos and tumult and fear of a war, that you needed to remember what home was. And part of that connection is the woods, it's the stream, it's the river, it's going hunting with your grandpa, it's going fishing with your dad. All of those things are what make America great. In the very first issue, there's a beautiful editorial he expressed hopes that people returning from the war would return to a more pleasant place and that the invigorating influence of the out-of-doors would cleanse their spirit and temper their character. 
And I've always loved the phrase, the invigorating spirit of the out of doors. And I think that's the thread that has gone through this magazine for 75 years. When you look back through decades, uh, you see a lot of pop culture. Some of the headlines, the recipes are funny and interesting. In the 50s and 60s, you see some kind of bizarre home ec type things like shrimp trees and um, some particular recipes for things like nutria. Perhaps their palettes were different back then. Definitely game recipes are still very popular, but these days that's a little more fine eating and a little less uh, possum stew. The magazine started out as a little more of a, what they would call a hook and bullet magazine than we are now. There were a lot of stories about how fishing was not just a sport. You know, fishing could put food on the table and you didn't have to have rash stamps. They liked having that fresh supply of relatively inexpensive fresh meat and people, they call it being a locavore these days, it has sort of a fancy name, but it's really sort of the same thing, knowing where your meat comes from and perhaps obtaining your own food. My granddad's name was Ellie Wilkie. He was an old Texas newspaper man. He started with the department in 1957, and then within a few months was appointed the editor of the magazine. I got to travel a lot with my granddad when he would cover stories for the magazine. I guess you'd call him a, a writing editor. He took his own pictures. He would also use me as an unpaid model. <laughs> This was taken on Lake Whitney. These uh, bathing beauties here are holding a string of fish. He recognized, I guess, uh, you know, one way to get Texas men to read uh, uh, the magazine. Uh, as I looked through those old magazines, I mean, even today, it makes me want to go hunting and fishing or get out into the outdoors. Uh, but I have wonderful memories. Back then, it was hunting and fishing and maybe a little camping, but now it's just so much broader. Preferred park settings are those which induce complete relaxation and rest. Settings in which nature can work her magic of mental and physical evil. In 1963, Governor John Conley merged the State Parks Department and the Game and Fish Commission, and he called it the Parks and Wildlife Department. Don't remember when it became color, but it was probably with the merger. 1965, they started using a few color photos inside. That increased as time went on, and sort of like, uh, you know, Dorothy opening the door to the Land of Oz. It was a whole different world. From then on, it became a beautiful showpiece. People all over America were buying it. We had this great illustrative history, and then we had this great photographic history. By the late 80s, when you mention Texas Parks and Wildlife to someone, they go, oh, they have the most beautiful photography. My name is Chase Fountain. I'm Earl Nottingham, and I'm a photographer for Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine. Going on 11 years? 20 years now. It's, a, it's the longest I've ever kept a day job. There's just two of us to cover 250,000 square miles. Luckily for the magazine, they do have freelance photographers that contribute, but Earl and I, we do have our hands full. More often than not, I'm on the road because of the sheer geographic distances. A million miles on his vehicle, I don't know how he does it. I base it more on how many sets of tires I go through. That's how I measure time and distance. In addition to traveling long distances, We've got to be at a location when the light is right. That's the big secret of photography. A lot of people will look at a photograph and, and think that you just went out and, and took a picture. In essence, uh, what we are doing is telling a story. Now we have to make it not only three-dimensional, 
but to draw the person in and tell a story with that one image. That's our job, is to capture that moment and bring it back to life so when the reader opens up the magazine, they can get a feel for what it was really like. Our readers have a very keen eye for art. I can honestly say that I think photography is the, the soul of the magazine. The words are just to fill space for pictures. <laughs> Don't tell them that, but you know, you know it's, it's, it's the pictures, you know? I think when people open the magazine, the first thing they notice is this photography. And that's what draws them into our words, thank goodness. My name is Russell Rowe, and I'm the managing editor for Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine. Most of my job involves editing, kind of handling some of the production work, doing fact checking, but I do get to get out and write stories every once in a while. Hi, this is Russell Rowe. The story I'm working on now is the story about best campsites in state parks. And I do have a deadline coming up. I gotta get out and visit all these state parks, but that's not necessarily a bad problem to have. We are heading up to Inks Lake State Park. I think part of the trick to writing is kind of opening your senses and just being able to describe the sights of a place, the sounds of a place. That, that 92 is a pretty good shot. Looks like it has a little bit of privacy too. Let's go look at some campsites. I want to get all the information I can before I go out into the field. One of our missions is to inspire people to get outdoors for your yeah, anniversary. We, we stay out on this little peninsula. Uh -huh. Hard to find a flaw with this one, <laughs> for sure. We want people to look at a beautiful picture, read this description of this incredible campsite that makes them want to go outside and enjoy our state parks. We'll appreciate y'all taking time to talk to us. The view's not too awfully bad. We do want people to look at the magazine and learn about Texas, but also be inspired to visit parts of Texas. And as more people live in our big cities, it's gonna be just ever more important that they know about these places that they can go to and experience the great outdoors in Texas. I think we found some winners. A couple of months before the magazine might hit your mailbox or you might buy it on the newsstand, we start assembling it. It's interesting how all those pieces kind of come together to make a really wonderful magazine. Every magazine has a certain design aesthetic, uh, but that aesthetic is influenced by every designer that works on it. Almost like if Mozart writes a piece of music, each person is going to have a slightly different interpretation. Except magazines aren't like classical music, they're more like jazz. How are we going to present this story? Where is it going to sit on the page? I don't think for the, the readers may notice with the magazine today is starting to shift in design. We have to be able to do layouts that work in both print and digital. With the advent of the internet, smartphones, and tablets, the way we consume information has shifted. When the print version is done, that becomes how are we going to tell this same story in the app. A really impressive double page photo in a magazine will take your breath away, but on a phone, it's that big. So we found ways to incorporate new media into traditional stories. Now when we talk about bird song, we can make a little digital jukebox of bird songs. We can do an article about a snail and leave a little slime trail behind. We need to get younger. If we want to stick around for 75 more years, then that younger audience really needs to be established in the magazine. I joke that there's a continuum between hip and hip replacement. Um, and, uh, and I recognize that I am, I am closer to this side than this side. And yet, we can still be hip. I've been guided for many years by something that Walt Disney said, it's better to entertain people and hope to hell they learn something than to try to educate them and bore them to death. And through its beautiful photography and, and some excellent writers, the magazine has been able to do that. I salute them for that. You know, it's writing about what's happening today with a goal, I think, of making what we write about tomorrow even better. 
those same things that they held dear 75 years ago are exactly the same things that we hold dear today. When I saw what all was in the magazine, it made me want to get out and do as much as I could in the outdoors. I would get the copy as soon as it came in the mailbox and, and jump into it. I got my first subscription to the Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine from my grandmother. Um, I was seven or eight years old um, and I've read it ever since. Help introduce me to parts of our state that I never knew existed. Um, and no doubt it had a very positive and profound uh, impact on me and likely an influence on where I've gone with my career. The whole point of our magazine is to be experienced. To be taken from the pages of the magazine and then experienced out in the great outdoors. When I first interviewed, I joked that I am the world's biggest fan of the great indoors. And I have the minty green complexion to prove that. However, since starting work here, I'm outdoors a lot more. Introducing my kids to the outdoors, we've taken up fishing we've taken up hiking. It's inspired me to get away from my desk. All right guys, November is here. About a week after we send off the magazine to the printer, we usually get the box in the mail, some of the first issues. All right. It is rewarding to finally have it in one piece and look through it page by page and just enjoy the experience. Just don't find any mistakes. <laughs> favorite spread. Every issue when we get done, we think it's the best one we've done until we start the next one. It's just that perfect moment. When we see the final result, we kind of cheer and high five each other and off we go to do it all again. And that next Monday, the whole thing starts all over again. Some people might say, oh, it's just a magazine, but it's really an emblem of something deeper. I honestly think that our role as a magazine is more important today than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Today, the value of being outdoors is probably even more important than it was in my granddad's time. I believe the magazine will be alive and well for many generations to come. It's part of our efforts to connect with all Texans, to take the great outdoors to where the people are, to introduce them to the places and stories and the beauty and biological and cultural richness of our home state. Um, and the magazine will always play an important role in that. In 25 years, uh, we'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary and uh, I hope to be around for it. We're really honored to be the present caretakers during this era of the magazine. I really can't wait to see what comes next.
My first love of photography is probably wildlife. You know, when I was a young photographer, that's really what I concentrated on was shooting, shooting pictures of wildlife. But really as my career has evolved, I'm becoming known more now for, for capturing the Texas culture, you know, and trying to capture those people and places that really epitomize what it's like to be Texan and what it means to be a Texan. This country was built on the backs of cowboys and Comanche Indians and bison hunters and, and early on I learned about all the history of all three of those groups and how they tie in and how they really interweave into the tapestry of this country in, in the Texas Rolling Plains. Because of that I became enamored with the history of the buffalo hunter and the history of the bison in Texas and on the South Plains. I was at Caprock Canyon State Park early one evening shooting pictures of the buffalo and their buffalo herd there at the state park and this one single bull was grazing and then at the very last minute, the very last light, he turned and looked towards the sun and I was able to capture a moment that's really become iconic. I know when a lot of people talk about pictures I've taken, they talk about that one photo that was taken probably 12 years ago. When people ask me the secret to taking a great photograph, I tell them it's really not a secret at all. It, it's really about, if you can, you can think of anything that you want to be. You say, I want to be good at blank. And if it's basketball or if it's baseball or if it's making quilts or if it's photography, it all boils down to doing a few key things right every time and understanding the elements within that discipline so your results become predictable. Like in photography, I, I tell people a couple of things they need to think about all the time. They need to think about light first and foremost, whether it's natural light with the sun or artificial light if you're introducing some strobes. Uh, composition is a, is a key component of it in my mind. You know, comp composition is one thing that if you learn it and learn it well, you can transform mediocre photos to great photos almost overnight. It makes a huge change in the way your f photographs look. I get asked a lot about what kind of equipment someone can buy that, that'll make them a great photographer. You know, really being a great photographer is a little bit about the equipment, but it's a lot about inspiration. It's a lot about understanding your subject and understanding how to interact with that subject, whether that subject's a, a landscape or whether it's people in the outdoors or whether it's, it's wildlife. It's just taking the time to do all the background information and understanding what it is you're taking pictures of. I spend as much time researching a subject is, or twice as much time researching a subject as I do actually photographing it because when I go into a situation I've got a finite amount of time and so I want to know all I can about what I'm taking a picture of whether it's whether I'm traveling to the Big Bend to shoot pictures of, of great landscapes or whether I'm traveling to, uh, to, to the northern panhandle to shoot pictures of prairie chickens or whether I'm tra traveling to someone's farm to shoot a picture of, of their hard-earned labor and their hard work and, and what it means to be a farmer in Texas, I try to know as much as I can about the subject. And to me, more than equipment, it, that's the secret to being a, a great photographer. Whoa, you didn't get that, did you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually I did. <laughs>
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.